Well, howdy, friends. Welcome to the Poultry Science Association's quarterly webinar, How to Get Published, a fireside chat with our journal editors. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. My name is Andy Vance. I'm executive director of PSA, and I really appreciate you joining us for what, what I've been really excited about, a conversation with our editors-in-chief of our two journals, the Journal of Poultry Science and the Journal of Applied Poultry Research. Before I introduce the distinguished gentleman on the panel today, I want to go over a few tips for using our Zoom webinars. First off the bat, this is being recorded. It'll be available on our PSA website within 24 hours of the conclusion of today's conversation. So please do feel free to share this with other members, people in your department uh, that, that might find it useful but weren't able to join us live. We really want you to get the most out of the conversation today. And so share this with your students, your fellow faculty members, or other practitioners of the poultry sciences. Uh, if you have a question, because this session is really going to be interactive, it's all about helping you understand the tips and tricks you need to make sure that your research is presented in a way that gets you published. The webinar uh, is, is all about that interaction. So just type your question in the Q&A tab. You'll see that there in your toolbar. Click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Along with that, don't use the raise hand icon. We're not going to put you on camera. Attendees um, can't really talk to ask questions. It's all through that Q&A widget. When you ask the Q&A, uh, the question in the Q&A tab, we'll answer your question here live during the broadcast, or you'll be alerted that the question is going to be answered live by the presenter. If it's something technical or whatnot, type it in there, and we may just type you back a response. But we'll take most of the questions live, obviously, during our conversation with the editors. Lots of time for Q&A. That's really the bulk of the presentation today. So if you've got questions already, feel free to, to start submitting those. You as an attendee will also be able to see or comment on other attendees' questions. So you can like it, just like we're on social media. And the more likes the question has, that's kind of like you saying, oh, I had that question too. We'll give it some higher priority as well. Otherwise, I'll just be kind of picking and choosing questions based on the flow of the conversation and, and uh, kind of take things in a logical order. So like the question if you've got one that's similar, uh, or if you'd also like to have that question answered during the Q&A portion of the conversation. If we do run out of time to answer those questions, we'll go through uh, and try to get as many of them as we can before time is over. And so that priority uh, will help us do that. We've disabled the chat option for the webinar, but do, do please feel free to give us your, your input after the webinar is over. We'd love to have your feedback on this webinar or other topics you'd like to see us cover as part of our ongoing PSA webinar series. We've got subtitles enabled for the webinar for your use, but you can turn those off clicking on the hide ca captions icon there at the bottom of the screen. All right, that's most of the housekeeping items. Uh, so now I want to introduce our speakers. As I mentioned, today's conversation is a fireside chat on how to help you get published in our journals. It features our two editors-in-chief, Dr. Brian Fairchild and Dr. Michael Kogut. I'll introduce Dr. Kogut first. He, with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Ag Research Service, is editor-in-chief of our flagship journal, Poultry Science. Dr. Kogut is a research microbiologist and the lead scientist at the Southern Plains Agricultural Research Center in College Station, Texas. There, Dr. Kogut has published more than 220 peer-reviewed scientific papers, so he knows a thing or two about getting published. He's written 19 book chapters, received five patents in research concentrating on the development of cost-effective immunological interventions to improve gut health by studying the role of the microbiota in immunity to infection, the role of dietary metabolites in promoting immune regulation and immune responses to pathogens, characterizing novel molecular targets that mediate the actions of dietary compounds and inflammation and immunity, and understanding the integration of central metabolic pathways and nutrient sensing with antimicrobial immunity. Also joining us will be the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Applied Poultry Research, Dr. Brian Fairchild from the University of Georgia. Dr. Fairchild is a native of North Carolina, and he received his PhD in physiology from North Carolina State University. He's been a member of the faculty of the Department of Poultry Science at the University of Georgia for 20 years, where he is a professor and extension poultry scientist working in poultry house management. And I'll tell you, most times when I get on a call with Brian, he's taking it uh, via Zoom from outside a poultry house somewhere on campus. He co-teaches the Advanced Poultry Management course. And his area of focus is broiler house environmental control, energy conservation, and management. Some of his recent projects have focused on factors affecting broiler body temperature, water composition, poultry house moisture control, and uh, he travels extensively, both at home and abroad, providing seminars on the principles of broiler management and poultry house environmental control. His CV, uh, like Dr. Kogut's, is extensive. And as I say, he has published a number of things. Uh, so he knows a thing or two about what it takes 
to get his work published in our key journals. One other thing about Dr. Fairchild, I should mention, he's first vice president of the Poultry Science Association's Board of Directors. That means he's going to be taking over the role of president of our association at the 2023 PSA annual meeting, which is now 13 days away. There's a little late tip uh, if you haven't already registered for the PSA annual meeting. The scientific program is stellar, and we would love to see you in Philadelphia in 13 days. It's not too late. Go ahead and register. Looking forward to having Dr. Fairchild's leadership as president of our association. And I want to give a personal thanks to both these gentlemen for their leadership on our journals. It is really the most important way that we advance poultry science worldwide through the publication of novel research in all of the variety of disciplines uh, that these two journals cover. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our speakers, Dr. Kogan and Dr. Fairchild. The way we're going to set this up is each of these gentlemen are going to give us some general observations to kind of start the conversation, what they've seen from the editor's chair, things that authors should know, uh, things that maybe are common pitfalls, areas where you get tripped up when you submit your work, things that uh, are commonly maybe uh, skipped over, ignored when you skim over the instructions to authors, that sort of thing. And then after each of them have given us some of their general comments and observations, we'll open the floor for questions. So again, anytime during the program, click that Q&A widget, submit your questions, and we'll take as many as we can. All right, Dr. Kogut, I want to open up the floor to you first for your general observations since you've taken over as editor-in-chief. Uh, we have seen tremendous improvements in both our time to first decision for reviews and, and the overall efficiency with which we're publishing uh, the the volume of research and a, and a significant volume of research. Our submissions are, are up this year, so we're getting through more publications, uh, more articles published in a more efficient time frame. So you've seen a lot, I'm telling you all this to say, you've seen a lot of publications, uh, a lot of submissions come through the door already in your tenure as editor. Give us your general take of the lay of the land and some observations you want to share with the community. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for the introduction. Um, what I wanted to start off with was a piece of advice that was given to me 40 years ago by my PhD advisor. And I still use it as a mental guide today. And I, I, I want to pass this along to whether it be new grad students, but even experienced researchers. The process of doing research, and it is a process from the time you start thinking about the question you want to ask through the development of experimental design through running the experiment is not completed until your work has been peer reviewed. Why spend weeks, if not months, doing experiments only to turn around and write a paper that does not follow the instructions to the authors and that is rejected because you have not followed the formatting? The ability to write a paper efficiently to get it published is in your hands and the tools are there for you simply by following the instructions to the authors that are provided by the society on the webpage. If you do that and realize peer review means the end of that experiment, now the process is complete. And if you think of it in that way, that the, the publication process is not something separate, it is a continuation of your experiment. It is a way for you to tell the audience, the general audience, of what you've done, what you've accomplished. And I think if you keep that in mind, the process of publishing becomes more important to you so that you can take the time to do it correctly. Because if there's anything I have seen over the last year since I took over as EIC is the inability, for whatever reason, to follow the instructions to a team. You follow the instructions, chances are you're going to at least get a revised decision, which means a little bit more work, but it'll probably be published. We are here to help you. We are here to help you get published, but we're not going to publish data that is not solid, that is not written correctly, that is not meaningful to the poultry science audience. I'll stop with that and let Brian make some comments and then we can start asking questions. Mm -hmm. Brian? You know, I think all, all of our good uh, advisors out there are probably saying the same thing that yours did, and uh, mine did as well. Um, you know, the project's not done until that paper's published, and I just wanted to echo that, that I've heard the same thing. So I've been uh, serving as the editor-in-chief for JAPR now for basically two years, and 
very similar observations that Dr. Koga just mentioned about his uh, time on the uh, in the editor in chief role for poultry science, and that is just the the failure to follow the guidelines, and it it won't keep the paper from getting published, but it sure does make it more difficult, and it's probably not as pleasant of a process. Uh, for the author uh, either whenever they are working on this. So we'd love to hopefully get the word out to everyone, new students, new people submitting papers to either one of these journals to really focus on you know following those guidelines for authors. They're available on the website uh, for the journals. You can download them in PDF format. They're even broken up in the website by chapter so you get to certain sections more quickly. So Take advantage of that resource and save save a lot of people work. I just I wanted to throw just a couple of things out, you know, because we all know what what makes up. I, well, I should say that I hope we all know what makes a good uh, paper successful. What are those components? And that's that's you know you got to ask yourselves a few things, such as you're going to have your problem, you're going to have you're going to ask a question about that problem, you're going to develop a hypothesis about that question and that problem. You're going to test out, you're going to design an experiment, some kind of experimental design to test that. Then you're going to analyze, collect that data, analyze it appropriately. And you need to be able to explain that as well in the paper on how this was analyzed. And then, um, you know, other things that keep in mind is don't forego the, uh, the, the, the lit search. You know, you want you want to be sure that whatever you're working on is something novel, and you know it it, it is kind of uh, I'm I'm gonna use the word painful because I hate it for people whenever they submit something and automatically I'm looking at the paper and I'm thinking well there's something published on this just about four years ago and it's actually here in the journal already, and so uh, just just trying to encourage people to to follow through on those good that good experimental process of putting this together. And then there's the style and grammar. You could have the best study in the world, but if we can't read it and the reviewers can't make heads or tails out of how you did it or what you found, it's not going to do any good. And they're, you know, it's their job is to assess the science, to make sure that we've done a good job of forming a hypothesis, testing the hypothesis. And we want to, uh, you know, the reviewers aren't going to be able to sit there and take the time to fix that paper because then, frankly, they should be a co-author on that paper if they do it and do that much work on it. So, uh, you know, to try to make it understandable and legible for all of that. So just keep in mind that, you know, we got to make sure that it's written well in a manner that we can focus on. So I, I did pull together a couple of things. And this is one of my... I, I've developed, I've always got pet peeves, <laughs> but the ones I've sort of come to, that, that has kind of come to form or I've developed over the last couple of years uh, working on the editorial board is I, I can't imagine, I, I can't reemphasize how many people do not format the papers accordingly for the journal. And I just, I looked this up yesterday just to kind of throw out a number for you. Out of the 91 papers that we've had submitted to the Journal of Applied Poultry Research uh, in 2023, I'm just talking about the first six months, uh, so pretty much up through yesterday, we've had to send back 46% of them for to fix the formatting before the paper even went into review. 46%. I have to admit, I was living in a, I guess I was just in a fantasy land before I came on to the editorial board thinking that everybody put these, these well-written papers into the journal because when I got them as reviewers, when I was in a reviewer role for the journals, I, I didn't, you know, the stuff was in pretty good shape. What I didn't realize was how much work the managing editor, David Busboom, has to do and, you know, the editor-in-chiefs had to do prior to me and, and Mike to get this journal and get this paper in a format to come to the reviewers. And it's something that, you know, I, that we were taught in grad school on how to do this, you know, to, to make sure that we formatted this correctly. So just make sure you go back to those, 
those guidelines um, on that. And um, I'm going to end that. I'm going to end with this, with that, and that, that point right there. I do have a few other common mistakes that I can share a little bit later, but let's see if we got any questions, Andy. Yeah, we, we do, but I want to, I want to tack on a, I guess a follow-up question to what you just said there about the formatting issue or really any of those things that kind of are in that instructions to author that uh, authors that people, you know, don't read or skim over or whatnot that, that, you know, would save a lot of headache. It, it seems to me that not only, you know, does that, uh, you know, put you off on the wrong foot as a, uh, as an author submitting to the journal, but it adds to the time, you know, so one of the things I hear a lot or heard very frequently in my early days uh, in this role with PSA is that uh, authors are really concerned about time to time to publication, time to publication, you know, they want the journal, they want high quality reviews, obviously, we really care about the quality of the science and the quality of the journal. But gosh, just like everything in life today, we want it now. We want it now. We want it now. That whole process you just described adds time that has nothing to do with the review, if you will. It has nothing to do with with uh, us at the journal and everything to do with, hey, that's how many ever more days uh, your article is in the pipeline because you didn't format it properly up front. Is that a, is that a fair read of the situation? It's a pretty, that's, that's 100% accurate. When you look at at um, the number, I mean, you nearly half of of the papers you've been reviewing fall in that bucket. I mean, that seems to me that we could all do ourselves a favor as as scientists by just checking that box up front. Did I make sure I formatted this correctly, um, Doctor Koga? Do you, do you would you say that's similar to what you see on poultry science? Would would there be that many that fall into the didn't format correctly bucket? I don't think it's quite as high as that because we have so so many more papers submitted. I think, yeah. uh, you know, we've had over 500 papers submitted already this year. I don't think right. we have anywhere near 40%. I would bet it'd be around 20, 25%. Yeah, but still, I mean, you're talking about significant addition of time right. Right. If according and, to the papers come you know, in. But at the same time, the reviewers or the section editors, when they see that, you put them off, you put them in a bad mood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to piss off the, the section editors and the reviewers with mm -hmm. this kind of thing. It, it's plain English in the instructions. Right. Um, to add on to what Brian says, there the instructions are so clear mm -hmm. that if, if any little waiver, simply because you didn't pay attention, just delays it all that more. And it may not necessarily be we send it back. We're finding it with poultry science. It's more that the paper is okay, but the revisions are extensive. And that's time there, the revision process. And yes, we give them 30 days. Many times we get requests for extension. And it's not because we're asking for more experiments. It's simply because the revisions. And if they would take care of it ahead of time, the revision process would take so much less time. Mm -hmm. There would be so far fewer revisions to make if you just proofread. And we're not getting people proofreading. I want to come back to your your pet peeves list in a minute, Brian. And I know Mike, you'll have some as well. Uh, but we got a great question here from Dr. Zudoff uh, up north of the wall. Uh, and the professor asks this: have, have we ever considered requiring an experimental design section? Uh, he added an observation. He'd love to see that as a requirement uh, at the beginning of the materials and methods section, because as a reviewer, it's really frustrating to have to dig for the information about the experimental design because it's only maybe inferred to you know inferred by the text as to what exactly we did what what are, what are thoughts on that uh as as editors is that something we ought to think about doing well i the instructions to authors detail that you are supposed to provide a detailed um experimental design if it's been done yes you can refer to the papers that you know you've done before but, you know, all through my years, we always say, yes, we've done it here. Here's the reference. But briefly, here's what we did. Right. So the, the instructions say you must design to tell us how to, the experiments were designed. What did it take to do it? What we're seeing a, a good number of papers do, and I, I advise people, this may be a great idea, is to use a visual instead of words, which it becomes difficult. People put some sort of visual representation of your experimental design. It provides that picture for the reviewer so they can see 
they don't have to fight the wording. They don't have to worry about how you are describing it. They can see it. So, you know, that that's encouraged. It's not in the instructions, but that's not a problem if you want to put some sort of visual um, schematic of your experimental design. But the reference to, you know, explaining your experimental design is mentioned in the instructions. So there again, we're back to you know, your first piece of advice. Read the instructions. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. But to Dr. Zudoff's point, um, you know, they are mentioned in both journals in the uh, instruction guidelines to authors, but we don't really, the, that doesn't really tell you where in the materials and methods to put that mm -hmm. experimental design. So to, to get back to the short answer to the question is, is no, uh, it hasn't been discussed yet. Uh, but it's probably something that we could throw out there for discussion amongst the uh, the editorial board as well as the journal planning committee, uh, just to get some feedback on that and see how um, you know just just look at it if it, that might if it would solve some problems help reviewers. Uh, I'm I'm not against it by any means. And of course, as a, as an author, you might say to yourself, you know, sometimes it's. Uh hard to read the label when you're sitting inside the bottle. So you're so close to your experiment and you've spent all this time with it. You may assume that the reviewer just sort of intuitively understands or, or can pick up what you were doing. Probably not necessarily always a safe assumption to know that they understand intuitively. Oh, sure. This is what I was doing in this broiler house, or this is what I was setting up on the bench. Here's what I, never, never a bad idea to try to, you know, get somebody else's perspective on that. Um, Here's one that's more, this is a question that came in that's a bit more uh, technical, perhaps, than philosophical. What should be the minimum number of birds and replicates in a study to get published? Any any guidelines, advice, rules of thumb, uh, best practices, shall we say, about minimum number of birds or replicates in a study? That is basically the rules and regulations of the animal care committees for each institution. You You have to do the what the minimum number of birds that it's uh, by law you can use. Now, what we've had had in the past, and I know Bob Taylor, the previous EIC, was constantly griping about the fact that people use the Animal Care Committee minimum number of birds as an excuse of not to repeat the experiments. Well, I have never seen in any institution that says, okay, we well, can only use the minimum number of birds is 25 to 40. But nowhere does it say you can't repeat the experiment. So if the minimal number of birds to do the statistical analysis X, no animal care committee does not uh, prevent you from running the experiment, which it should be done at least twice. So it's not necessarily the number of birds, it's how many times you repeat the experiment so that you can make a conclusion that it's important to the industry because 20 birds is not a lot. You do it once, you're trying to draw conclusions, I have a problem with that. You do it twice with 20 birds. Okay, maybe we're getting somewhere. I'd like to see four or five. You're only that many, that few birds. You're doing a house like behind Brian there. You know, maybe we can get away with uh, one experiment because you're talking about 2,000 birds. But uh, it's it's each institution's animal care committee and what their rules are in terms of minimal bird numbers. Kind of follow up on that, um, you know, the ICA committees too, I can't speak for every institution out there, but uh, in most cases, yes, they are wanting to make sure the animals are used uh, efficiently. They're trying to make sure that we don't, you know, use excessive numbers when not needed, but at the same time, they don't want you to do a study with, a, with, with animals and that you can't publish because you didn't use enough animals. That means that you just basically might have wasted that opportunity there, uh, you know, didn't use those animals effectively. So I have, you know, my experience has been, you know, working a couple of different uh, institutions, uh, working with them, that, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, the committees have, I've actually seen where committees have come back, not to me, but to colleagues and things where they've said, are you sure? This is enough animals to answer your question effectively and get it published because they do not want to get there. So, you know, I I I get it. I have heard the similar excuse about um, when when I came up about replication numbers that they kind of threw the I cut committee under the bus or the ethical committee or whatever. 
uh, to to use them as the the scapegoat. But I kind of in the back of my mind saying, what kind of conversation happened there? So it comes back to good experimental design. And going back to that person's question, um, you know, I, I don't know if I can answer. You know, I don't know if there is a specific replication number that I would recommend because it's going to vary depending on what the experiment is, what data is being collected, variation. There's tests that you can do if you have access to some previously data done in that area so that you can calculate the variation and get an estimate of that, of the ideal replicate number for the study. And I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll add one more thing that I think might relate to this. And that is identify your experimental unit. Um, you know, I work in the area of environmental control. And when somebody sends me a paper and they had two treatments, a hot treatment and a cold treatment, they had six room, six pens in each room. One room was hot, one room was cold. And they tell me that their rep was six. Uh, they are wrong. Um, that rep was one because it was applied to the room. So make sure that, you know, and like, like Mike mentioned, behind me here, you know, this is a house. I, I you know, this is a 20,000 square foot house. Uh, yes, it's got a lot of birds in it, but technically if you apply the treatment to the house, it's an N of one, unless you can figure out a way to do sections and, and make pins or something in there to divide up your reps. So make sure you identify that experimental unit uh, correctly whenever you're doing it, because that's, that is one of the things that has led to rejection of some papers uh, in, in both journals. Let, let me add one other thing, Andy, to the, the discussion here. Doing an experiment, even with 20,000 birds, okay, you're applying some sort of treatment or whatever, mm -hmm. and you only do it with that one batch of birds, and now you're writing a paper and you're drawing conclusions and you're trying to convince the industry that what the novelty of this without knowing whether the next batch of birds are going to respond the same way. And I think that's the key for us versus say, human medicine, where they have limited number of, 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 of samples and patients. We have the ability to run large experiments and repeat experiments so that when we do draw conclusions, the industry can be confident that the results we're showing are consistent between batches of birds because the birds that hatch in December in the north certainly are going to react differently to environmental conditions as they are here in Texas today where it's 112 <laughs> degrees. And even with good fan and ventilation, birds are going to react differently to what you're throwing at them. So the more birds, how many times can you do that experiment so you can show the industry that it's consistent mm -hmm. between batches of birds? Mm -hmm. Our esteemed colleague. Uh... You could do multiple houses on a farm. You know, if you've yep. got a six house farm, you could do a three and three. Um, but uh, yes, uh, I'll be honest with you. My personal uh, objective when we're doing field trials is a minimum of three flocks, a minimum of three flocks. We usually go a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, our esteemed colleague, Dr. Robert Taylor, who we referenced uh, earlier, uh, added some some commentary that I think is a good good uh, observation to share. Uh, two things by way of extension of the conversation here. One, power analysis would indicate the minimum number of animals for a particular study. And two, if you use that committee as your scapegoat or excuse, make sure you're telling the truth because you know, it only takes a phone call to verify that claim, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you say, oh, well, that damn committee, they said this, uh, you know, Mike just might call them up and say, hey, is this really what you said? And if you lied, again, not a great look when you're when you're submitting to a journal. Any any additional commentary on that, fellas? Yeah. OK, I think we covered that one. Pretty I agree. Good. Amen. And Dr. <laughs> Dr. Taylor, glad you're here. You've been a, been, been a, been a great, uh, a great resource to the association for a long time. Appreciate you joining in today and adding to the conversation. Uh, Dr. Fairchild, I want to come back to your pet peeves for a minute. We we, we covered uh, a couple one. What else What else do you have on your, your hit list of things that you see frequently or things that, uh, whether they happen that frequently or not, are the surest way to get on the editor's uh, naughty list? I'm, I'm going to, this is actually one of Mike's too. I know this because he's brought it up multiple <laughs> times. Uh, re when reviewers resubmit a, I'm not reviewers, when authors 
resubmit a revised manuscript, there are instructions that go in that letter, that revision letter, that says what they're supposed to do. One of those things is to highlight the areas that was changed to help the reviewers, help the section editor isolate, you know, kind of focus in on those problem areas quicker and identify that, uh, you know, to, to, to see if the problems have been addressed efficient, uh, adequately uh, for that. And again, um, you know, we get a lot of papers that come back both, I don't know, I can't speak for poultry science, but Japper, we've had quite a few where it comes back, I take a look at it, I don't see any highlighting, it goes back to the author, it adds time. I'm not going to waste the I'm not going to waste the section editor or the reviewer's time looking at a paper where they're going to have to really work hard to get to those answers because they've already worked hard one time reviewing that paper. We want to make it, we want to be cognizant and appreciative of their time as well. Well, and, and you know, there again, kind of like what we were saying about the formatting issues earlier, we've made a concerted effort as uh, an, an association, as an editorial board, uh, you two individuals in particular have made it, I think, a personal mission to make that time to first decision, time to publication as efficient as as it's possible. But that's a that's a, a, a two way street, right? It's a partnership that all of those all of those steps in the process where the author has to do some additional work in many cases that could have been prevented uh, up front, but, but revisions happen. We know that there's an efficiency at play. If you don't highlight the things you're supposed to highlight, guess what? You've just added time to the review process that has nothing to do with the reviewer, the section editor, uh, the managing editor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Help well, us help uh, you. In other words, let, let me add something to that too. Andy. what I've gone to under those situations, is that the, the revision process, you give uh, the authors 30 days. If they haven't highlighted and they have to make those kind of changes, I give them four to five days. I don't give them 30 days anymore. Yeah. All you have to do is highlight it. Right. You should be able to do it overnight. But I give them a limit. It's like, this needs to be in in four or five days. Or guess what? Rejection. Because you can't follow the instructions. Yeah. And I'm sorry that makes me a bad guy, but... Um, these reviewers and section editors have busted their butt to get to that point, and you can't take the time to do read the instructions. Four or five days should be enough to highlight, get it back in, and we'll have a decision made that day right. when it comes back. Well, and that's—I mean—I think to your 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 point, you know, there's a uh, a collegial respect that you know we, we we owe one another, right? You know, so we want to be respectful of our reviewers' times, of our section editors' time. Uh, they're, they're doing that as, uh, you know, service to the broader scientific community. You know, it's not a glamorous job being a, a section editor. And by the way, we hope that you're all doing your part reviewing, not just submitting, you know, your work as authors, but in turn reviewing papers as well. So, you know, the hope would be right that, uh, authors will be respectful of your time as reviewers by doing those things that we ask you to do, like highlighting those revisions. What else you got on your top 10 list there, Dr. Fairchild? Uh, this is one, and it, it's a little difficult for me to fix, so it always has to go back to David uh, Busboom, our managing editor, to do this, but, um, and it does take some time, because I, I, I'm not sure it's an easy fix for him either, so he has, it takes him a little bit of time to do this, but when you submit a paper, or when, when an author submits a paper, there are different article types in the system. There is a research report, there's an applied research a uh, note or applied research paper, a, a research note type thing, a uh, review article. Uh, you know, there's these different article types. And I, I can't quite understand why, but people choose, it's almost like they just pick randomly. Some some authors do when they submit. And I'm like, this is not a review paper. And, then, you know, I get get that a lot. Uh, we'll go through this. This is, a, this is a research report. Uh, and sometimes on the applied research notes, I, you know, we've had research papers come in that frankly did not have the, probably the most robust um, experimental design and therefore did not meet the criteria for a research report, but would be fine as a applied research note. And so just pay attention, you know, that I guess that again, that's one of those things during the submission process I don't think there's any rules written about this, selecting the right article type, but it does take time. And like you mentioned, both of us are kind of in a, 
a mode right now of trying to make the journal as efficient as possible, uh, you know, because people want to get their papers published right. in a timely fa fashion. And so all of this just adds time to getting that corrected. It's not something I can fix myself that I'm aware of in, in the, in the uh, um, editorial manager system. And I think, you know, I would just uh, encourage people if when in doubt, raise your hand and ask a question, right? If you're not sure, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, e email one of these two gentlemen, uh, email, yeah. uh, email David Busboom uh, at the PSA office, our managing editor, you know, will, if you don't know, uh, by all means, I mean, I, I don't know if I entirely believe this all that there are no stupid questions, but the stupidest question is the one you didn't ask, right? Especially if it's uh, something where, hey, one of these uh, experts in the room can can help you. Um, Dr. Sudoff uh, checks back in from the frozen north and asks if there are any advice for the inexperienced authors, right? We were all we were all rookies once, uh, and he remembers vividly seeing reviewer comments that were hard not to take personally, especially early in my career. Now, I, you two gentlemen are warm and cuddly fellows. Uh, I, I know this would not be applicable to either of you, but what advice would you have for inexperienced authors dealing with some of those constructive comments that we might get and how do you whether it's you know, do i need to develop a callus do i just need to get a tough skin do i need to figure out how to separate professional feedback from you know, you know feeling like i'm getting thrown under the bus as an individual human being what what's your advice or observation there Great question, by the way, Martin. And you you are a warm, cuddly type, unlike these two, so. <laughs> For sure, you have to develop a tough skin. Uh, it's tough to take criticism. To help the process, use your mentor, use your advisor. That's what they're there for. They are there to read your paper. They, are, they should be the first line of defense. They should give you, be the ones that give you the hard time why this is going in. Um, I realize we're trying to train our students to become independent, but at the beginning of the process, that's not the time to be teaching these kids to be independent. They need to get the verbal feedback from their advisor. This does not make it. You have to do this, you have to do this. If you don't get the mentorship who's thinking as a reviewer, then this, the student is gonna think, this is okay, what I've done is okay. And then it goes in and all of a sudden they're getting this, this review back, which is, let's say 90% of the time is scientific criticism. It's not a personal attack. It reads like it many times because you're so close to the work. You thought it was fantastic. But Andy, as you mentioned earlier, sometimes you get so close, you don't see the holes that are there. And right. that's what you're trying to be pointed out. Sometimes the reviewers go overboard and make it seem like, you were a fool for not thinking of this. Well, that's where the advisor should find those holes because that's what they're there for. They're a mentor for a reason. Yeah. But develop a tough skin. I've always, and I've gone through it, and I, I remember distinctly, I still do it. I count to 10 and usually wait two or three days to respond. I have to calm down because I am so involved in that work for someone to come in and say, you know, there's, this is wrong or there's something here, yeah. I, I would respond with an emotional response. And that's not the way to go either. It's okay. Look at each individual point and either agree. And believe me, reviewers love it when you agree. If you don't argue and it's a valid point, agree. Make the change or explain why you did it this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes, most of the times, reviewers won't make you go back and do an experiment. They'll accept that, okay, You've done the experiment. The work has been done. Tell them why it went this way and not this way, and they'll accept it and say, okay, I, that, that's good. So count to 10, wait a day or two, respond. You have 30 days to respond. So you should be able to take a couple of days, go have a beer, and realize that it's not a personal attack. We are trying, I mean, we, obviously we don't know if it's a student or if it's an experienced uh, researcher that's submitting the paper, but we are here as scientists to help. We're not trying to tear you down. We're trying to build you up. We want your paper to be published, but you are going to have to develop a tougher skin if 
um, you know, you have to run the mama every time someone criticizes you. You're not going to make it in science, put it that way, because you are going to be criticized. And, and you now I would add, you know, just an observation to the things that we've been talking about here in the first 30 or 40 minutes together, putting yourself in the boots of a, of a reviewer, your, your comments might be a little more uh, terse, shall we say, if you've dealt with you know, formatting or the, the person clearly didn't do a good lit review, like Brian mentioned earlier that, hey, I just read something about this, you know, published in this very journal two years ago, if they haven't done. So, you know, also one of those things, if you do a good job up front, so to speak, uh, you're not going to have set that reviewer off on the wrong foot. Whereas if they've already seen, oh my gosh, it's just been one thing after another with this paper, maybe you're less like human nature, right? You're less likely to be uh, soft and fuzzy when you submit that feedback back. Well, and let's not forget a mentor may have other students who have, he has a bad day because the other students' papers were crap. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, they miss that and it comes back. So yeah, it's it's we're human. We're human. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Tough skin is something that you have to develop to make it in, in in science as a whole. And you wouldn't think in poultry. I know my my kids used to say, "Ah, it's poultry. Why do you have to worry about it?" And they're saying, "No, it's still science. It's yeah. something that we have to prove a point." And um, it's tough to take criticism, but if you stop and think about what they're actually asking or is commenting on, I think you'll find ninety nine percent of the time is good advice and something that you'll take with you in the future. And your ability to take constructive criticism and put it into practice uh, really will separate you in your career, whether we're talking about those of us who are going to be in academia, those of us who are going to be in industry, those of us who are going to be uh, in the regulatory uh, research community, USDA, whatnot. I'm I'm just sort of going out on a limb and assuming, Mike, that, you know, nobody at USDA is overly concerned about, you know, co covering up for your feelings, uh, you know, that, that Mike got some critical feedback and he might be upset about it. There's not a, not probably a whole lot of uh, consideration for that. Likewise, uh, you know, as you go up the ranks in faculty and get, you know, farther and farther up along your your path to tenure and so on and so forth. Uh, we're, we're not spending a lot of time with the tissue box hanging around. So uh, good, good couple of questions here. Really appreciate all of you, by the way, submitting um, those, keep bringing those in into the Q and a space. I'll just um, add on to that one little thing here. I mean, Mike's, I can echo, echo, echo everything Mike said, um, you know, and it's easy to uh, take it personal. I, I try to be conscious when I'm writing these things, not to come across as terse, uh, but it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, Andy, you could send me an email today and I can sit there, depending on what kind of mood I'm in, I can take offense to it because I feel like you're yelling at me, even though yep. you uh, you just wrote right. this just normal email, just a statement. So try and I, I know it's easier said than done, but don't take it personal. This is constructive criticism. I do the same thing uh, that Dr. Kogut just mentioned. I don't respond right away. I don't write when I'm angry. <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, you, you just, you're not thinking straight. So, uh, you know, just, just take it in there. Just, just address the question and move forward. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many of my mentors have told me this over the years where I walk in there and I go, you know, start my viewers, blah, 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 you know, uh, do they even know what 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 in the egg comes out of you know I don't even know but anyway uh, um, you know we that they they've always said just just do it Brian just sit down just go through each point and I'll go ahead and add that one real quick is that again I know Dr Taylor and I talked about this a lot I guess Mike's probably already starting to see some of this too but um, when you get those reply when you get that revi the that review back as an author. Go ahead and address everything that's in the review. I can't tell you how many revised manuscripts come back, and we're going down the list. And if I you know, if if I didn't catch it, the section the section editor will. They're going to come back and they're going to tell me, well, they didn't address this, they didn't address this, so we need to send it back for a revision number two, which adds time. So go ahead and take care of those revisions completely, even if you're not going to change anything in the paper at least put an explanation in there as to why you're not changing that. Let us know what is going on so that the section editor and reviewer and, and, and we know what's, what's happening. Yeah. Rebuttals are very, very 
important on response to a, for a reviewer. Rebut, if you do not agree, rebut. Tell us why. Yeah. Scientifically, you have to have a scientific reason why you're rebutting, not an emotional one. I, I mean, month, within the first month I was here, I had someone send me a letter and tell me what a jackass I was, blah, 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 blah. And I basically told them, if you will put this into words that are scientifically solid, I'll listen to them. But I'm not going to listen to you tell me that the reviewers are an idiot, so I must be an idiot, and you're right. That's not going to get you anywhere except for rejection. Mm -hmm. Rebut it scientifically. Then I'll listen. I'll read. And for the most part, I'll probably agree. Because I'll see your point of view. Make a cogent argument. Uh, this is a process questions related here to this whole thing about reviews and, and revision. So do revised manuscripts go back to the reviewer for a second review? Or how do we decide if a revised manuscript returns to the reviewer for a second review? What's that process look like? Our, I, I know on my side, um, you know, what we'll with, with Japper, what we'll do is um, we will, if it's a major revision, I'll leave it up to the section editor, but it might go back to the one reviewer uh, or have, have forbid if both, both people said, hey, major revision, we got to really fix this, then I would like to make sure everybody's happy with it. Um, if it's a minor revision, just, just a few little points, just fix it. The section editor usually goes through and addresses those, checks it off, make sure that the uh, the author has done a good job of addressing those reviewers' suggestions, and and uh, um, and it, it it comes back with a decision. Dr. Kogut, sound same on poultry science. For poultry science, if they're editorial criticisms, um, the section editor makes the decision and doesn't have to go back. If it's hardcore science uh, experiments have to be redone or reevaluated, reanalyzed, then it will go to the reviewer. Um, that made the comment. Uh, this uh, question on on our you know guidelines, policies, or general advice on using commercial product names in our journals versus generalizing to non-commercial acronyms or modes of action, uh, that that sort of thing. What what's the feeling on using, or what's our policy? Maybe would be a better to say this, or both. Your your recommendation on the use of commercial product names, trade names, et cetera, in our submissions? A good question. If it's a product that is, is out there and you're just product testing, then you need to use the product name in the paper. If it is an experimental product, um, you need to give us close and definition of what it is, but you can call it product A versus product B versus control. Um, but if, uh, if it's a phytochemical made up of multiple plants, then you're going to have to tell us what plants or what oils are in there. Um, uh, you don't have to, you know, if it's, like I said, if it's experimental, it hasn't been approved, and, you know, you can, you can use code names, but if it's a commercial product, then you need to use the code name and still give the detail. You have to think back to what the purpose of the materials and methods is. And, yeah. you know, one of the things is, is that there's another group out there, another lab that wants to repeat that study, they got to be able. You know, there's certain things they have to know to be able to repeat that in under the same conditions that that the original paper did. So, I agree with everything uh, Dr. Koga just said. I, I would say just focus on, um, you know, again, basically his guidelines right there. I think is pretty acceptable amongst several journals. My question here, um, talking about our article publication charges, and I, I think this is a, a, a fair question because I know it's one that we've talked about internally at times when people ask for uh, assistance or uh, what, what we can do to either offer discounts or waivers, et cetera, to scientists from low income countries or from some of the disadvantaged parts of the world. Um, would you share with us, and, and I guess I'll take first crack at this and uh, give it from a uh, an association standpoint, I'm, I'm sort of operating under the assumption that everybody on the webinar here, because of how we've marketed this, are members of the Poultry Science Association, but the, the first and most obvious thing you could do to save a significant chunk of change on your article publication charges, article processing charges, is being a member of the Poultry Science Association. Uh, it surprised me to no end to learn that maybe only a third of our submissions to our journals are from PSA members, and that gets you a $500 U.S. discount right off the top 
of your uh, APC. So take that into consideration if you are not a member or if you have a colleague, uh, co-author who is not a member. And also make sure that the PSA member is the, the corresponding author because that's how the discount is lined up. If you're the 17th author listed uh, and the 16 ahead of you are not <laughs> PSA members, you're not going to get the PSA member discount. So the corresponding author needs to be uh, a PSA member to take advantage of that. But but Mike, let's start with you uh, about, about our journal policies and opportunities too, because we want to encourage good science from anywhere in the world, but how do we, how do we help those authors from some of the uh, less uh, resource intense regions of the world? Well, usually it takes as part of the cover letter, a request that if the paper is accepted, that uh, we provide discount or a waiver. Um, and then it comes to me. And I have X number of, of waivers that I can offer during the course of a year. Um, I don't think I have ever turned down a request from one of the low income countries or people that uh, countries to authors that are, don't have research money uh, for whatever reason. Um, even if it's uh, 20 or 30 percent discount, uh, most of the time I give the full discount. Um, and, you know, I'm sure there may be one or two that sneak in, but for the most part, it's going to be de dependent on the region, the country, the university. I mean, we've even had people with uh, this this week. I had a request from a startup company for a waiver. I have a little bit of difficulty with a company. If you're a startup, you should have the money to pay for it. I'm not trying to advertise your product. Um, but if you're coming from a, um, we've had a, a large number in the last year from Turkey after the earthquake, the major earthquake last year, where they just don't have the money. They're trying to rebuild, but they've done the experiment. I have granted full waivers for those papers if they're accepted. And, you know, the waivers are, are dependent 100% on whether the paper is accepted. It's not just, okay, you can have it, but I would like to know at the time of the submission, put it in the cover letter. Don't wait till after the paper is accepted because if I run out of waivers, I can't do anything about it. Give it to me ahead of time so that David and I have a, an idea of who is there um, so that we keep track of it. Um, unfortunately, we get too many that are after it's published. Well, I understand that, but let me know, let us know ahead of time. It's better that way. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I know that's been something we've talked about in our our editorial board calls before. The the, the people that wait till the eleventh hour and yeah. say, "Oh, by the way, can I yeah. get a can I get a waiver?" Uh, that needs to be done upfront yeah. as part of that that cover letter. Really important. Yeah. I agree. Sure, yeah, I, I, it's it's very good to have that. I really appreciate the the authors that go ahead and. And just address it in their cover letter and the initial submission, and uh, not try to ambush me at the uh, at the end of the process when after a decision's been made. Uh, just just also to point out there to everybody, but our publisher Elsevier, they've also got a program, and so it's uh, it's a Research for Life. Um, you know, they they have a website you can go to, but they have countries categorized, and so if you're in a certain category. Elsevier will that they have the means to help publish that paper, uh, you know, even in our journals. So, um, but if, if it comes back and you know, I deal with it on a case by case basis. Uh, you know, it comes in, the request comes in. If it fits into that research for life categories, then you know, we pass that on to Elsevier. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, we make a decision to uh, whether or not we're going to use one of our waivers. <laughs> uh, a couple more questions here as we get kind of down to the shank of the hour here, and we'll we'll, we'll wrap up pretty close to the, the top of the hour to be respectful of everyone's time and the time allotted for this webinar. But a couple good questions to finish up. Uh, one, Evan asks, what's the organization's process for identifying expert reviewers for a specific topic area, and how many are generally engaged for a potential review of a man's manuscript? Uh, I can answer that. We beg. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm uh, I mean, uh, you know, on a more serious note, no, near serious. That that is one of the hard parts about being a section editor for both journals. I think you know, Dr. Kogan can correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, that is one of the hardest parts is to try to find the two or three people you need to review the paper that that will agree to review it. And I've had 
I've had papers. Some of our section editors have had papers where I've seen them get turned down 15 times by, by different members of poultry science that they've been asked to review these papers. And, um, you know, for a variety of reasons, but um, it really makes it difficult. And sometimes, I'll be honest, when you're, if you're out there and you're wondering, where's my paper at? Why haven't I heard anything back? Odds are it's probably in a situation where somebody, for whatever reason, they're just not accepting the invitation to review. So um, choosing that reviewer, I can't speak for my section editors, but I'll, I will, I have had to process some of the papers myself where some of our section editors have been authors or co-authors on a paper. So I will typically will run those through the system, the review process myself, or, or maybe we got one section editor that's got just too much on their hands. I'll help them out with that. What I do is I will look, a lot, when authors submit the paper, they have the option to make recommendations for who they would like to review the paper. I sometimes will take at least one of those. <laughs> and then I'm going to find one of mine that I feel like maybe might be a little bit more independent, you know, because I don't know that relationship between a person. I'm, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt that, you know, they there's not some kind of a, a, a relationship there, uh, collaboration, but uh, I always like to have somebody that I pick. And so I go and try to find somebody, you know, within our membership database, our directory, or through the um, editorial manager database that is got the focus in that area that we're, that we're asking for. And nowadays, just so that everybody knows, the section editors, whenever a reviewer does a um, review, they get scored. And so we can, we, they get a score on that review. And so we can go back and, you know, I, I'm not going to pick somebody who takes forever to turn in a review, even though they probably turn in great reviews. I can't keep, I can't wait, you know, six weeks to get this review back. We want to try to get, again, like you mentioned earlier, Andy, and, and several times, we want to be cognizant of everybody's time and try to process these as officially as possible. Yeah. I'll let Mike add. Oh, Andy, a pet peeve of mine that we haven't addressed. And I, one of the things I wanted to change, when you submit your paper, the process includes keywords. Mm -hmm. You, We use those keywords to find mm -hmm. reviewers. So if you're gonna use a keyword of broilers, guess what? There's 3000 people in the database. I yes. need specifics, okay? So your keywords should be as specific as possible. There's also categories that you choose the paper to be under in the uh, submission process. Try to be as specific in choosing your categories. Again, they're broilers, there's layers, but there are, you know, what about them? What are we looking for? What kind of paper is this fitting? That helps us narrow the list down to people that can scientifically evaluate your paper based on the clues that you're giving us. If you keep it broad, then the reviews are gonna go out and it may take time because how many times, like, as Brian said, I when I was on a section editor, I've had reviews, 18, 19 people say no. And most of them said, it's not my field of expertise. Well, that's right. because the key words they provided were broilers and nutrition. <laughs> and it's like, that's not helping anyone because yeah. everyone has a specificity. And if we can't find that specific person, it takes Hi. And I would also just add, you know, that, that each of us as uh, members should also be thinking about, am I reviewing, am I making myself available to review papers, right? There's some, there's some uh, give and take there as well. If I'm submitting articles to the journal, I should also be uh, serving as a reviewer uh, at least a few times during the course of the year as well. I think that's really important as part of the the process. Okay. We, we are here at the end of the hour. Um, if you two gentlemen are amenable to, I've got, we've got maybe two more questions. We can do kind of in a lightning round here. Um, uh, and I'm going to enter, I'm going to end with Martin's, but I want to ask this, this last one, because I think it's a really uh, unique and interesting question as reviewers. Sometimes we receive papers to review from various regions globally that often involve locally available breeds, maybe ones that aren't in one of Brian's houses in Athens, Georgia. Uh, at times that can present some challenges to providing feedback on the management practices associated with these particular breeds. Do you have any advice to reviewers facing those type of situations or scenarios? We say, geez, 
I've never seen one of these in one of my labs yeah. or, or, or barns or houses. Uh, what, what do you do in that situation? Well, that's an interesting question because we ran into it last week with a with specific paper that we thought didn't fit uh, PSJ. We'd send it over to Japper and Brian gave us great advice. It was one of the helpful hints I was going to add. Keep in mind that both journals are international journals. Yes. So even regional questions are important, but they need to be novel or the conclusions need to appeal to an international audience. That's a that's very important. Just uh, the breeds, okay, they're going to be different and they're going to respond differently, but they need to be asking the questions. The other piece of advice that Brian gave last week, if you're doing a survey of some sort of your regional situation, you need to provide the questions that you're asking for that survey. It may be regional, but if you don't provide us the questions, the reviewers can't re can't make a judgment on whether or not this is scientific relevant. So it's an international journal, and people need to realize that it needs to appeal, even if it's only a dozen people in the world. It's still international, and your regional stuff can be important, but it has to provide something novel uh, to to the community. Well said. All right, fellas, let's wrap this thing up. Uh, it's been a great conversation, uh, wonderful questions. And I think uh, Dr. Zudolf asks one that uh, I know we have, have discussed uh, at different times over the past six months, and I suspect we'll continue to discuss. What are the implications of generative AI or chat GPT in specific for scientific publishing? Does this stuff keep you up at night, guys? Like, uh, what do you what do you see here in terms of the role that uh, artificial intelligence in its various forms. What are the implications for those of us who are involved in scientific publishing and trying to advance the dialogue? We, we've we already put verbiage <laughs> into the guidelines. So read those guidelines on this, uh, everybody, because, you know, there, it's basically in there saying that, you know, the you could use some AI to help you analyze your data, but not draw the conclusions. Um, you can use the pay, use AI to make your paper read better, but not write it. <laughs> so am I, I'm not losing a lot of sleep on this yet. Maybe I'm just naive and I put too much faith in people that they're going to do the right thing. But, uh, you know, we're scientists and I just hope that, uh, you know, everybody is you know going to stick to doing it appropriately. But that's yeah, I, I would say refer to that documentation and, uh, you know, there are guidelines there on that, on what it could be used for and what we're hoping it's not going to be used for. Yeah. And, and I think the member institutions where the papers are coming from are putting up guidelines that the uh, the faculty or the USDA, for that matter, have to follow uh, in, in terms of using AI. Analyzing data is not a problem. Writing the paper how do you find it? I don't know. I have, you know, it, it, but at the same time, how do you evaluate a paper, whether it's AI or not? And, and that's where we're going to have to draw the line. But right now it's institutional regulations that are going to tell. Um, USDA definitely has that if, that if you're going to use AI and you get caught writing a paper that's based totally on AI, you're going to be loads of trouble. Yeah. And, and, and if I recall, well, and so that was going to be a, a point I was going to make too, Dr. Kogut, I mean, you're not only your institution and, and so on, but I would also be worried, you know, some of the things you read about AI, the, the chat GPT will give you an answer to whatever question you put in front of it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the right answer. So, you know, you want to be, you want to be especially mindful. You don't unintentionally get your hind parts in a crack because you uh, outsourced to to Skynet uh, some of your labors. Uh, Dr. Fairchild, you referred to the verbiage that we put in there. I think we also talked about disclosing. What what are my responsibilities as an author of disclosing That's how correct. I've used uh, whatever the device is? Could you could you mention that? I mean, I think you just covered it. I mean, it's 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 there that it needs to be disclosed in the paper uh, what when it's used and what is used, how it's used. All right. And I, and I think we specifically say your chat GPT is not listed as a co-author. That's correct. But you have to disclose, you, you have to disclose what you did 
as as part of that yeah i think it's really important transparency matters right part yes. of the process i mean we, we we have to describe statistical analysis computerized statistical analysis of use so why would we not describe the ai program if it was used for something yeah. um and it's, i mean obviously it's a can of words when we discussed it at the at the uh journal planning meeting it was obvious that there are going to be scrupulous unscrupulous people that are going to use ai to write their papers Right. And I don't know how we're going to enforce or check these people out, but it's going to be something in the future we have to worry about for sure. Yeah. yeah. All right, gentlemen, it's been a great hour plus now. Wonderful conversation from the two of you. Uh, any any parting shots or final comments uh, from the the editor's chair? Uh, Dr. Fairchild, we'll, we'll give you first shot at it and let Dr. Kogut wrap things up. Well, we didn't get quite through all the uh, little pet peeves, but uh, we've hit a lot of the major ones today. Uh, I think the last one I'm going to throw out there is just one last thing to for people to keep in mind when they're putting their papers together is <clears throat> there's a lot of pressure nowadays from multiple angles, institutions, and everything for numbers, number of papers. And I am going to encourage everyone to go for quality over quantity. Uh, there's a lot of instances where, uh, you know, you've got this study, you've done several, as a part of this study, you've done several experiments. Every experiment is not going to be a standalone paper. And it, it's going to make that paper so much stronger. You'll get more citations with that stronger, more higher quality paper than you were going to be trying to split it up into lesser papers that may not even all get read uh, because they're so dang similar, you know, and they may not even get published. And that, that's something that we're seeing a, a situation come through, at least on, on Journal of Applied Poultry Research. Um, we've had some papers come in that are so similar that we can't yeah. we accept them. Dr. Kogut, final final thoughts, observations, comments? Yeah, one thing I wanted to bring up was both journals are English language journals. Mm -hmm. Last year, 70% of all the papers that were published in PSJ came from outside the country. We ask that instead of waiting till after the review process, that you do your English editing service or your native person that's going to read it do it before you submit the paper. Don't wait until afterwards, because I'm sure we are rejecting good 10 to 20 percent of good scientific papers because it's uninterpretable because of the poor English. I sympathize, I empathize, but at the same time, we have the ability, you have the ability to find English speaking services. I know uh, Elsevier also provides that service that you can have your uh, paper reviewed beforehand. For its English content, it again, it saves time and it saves you frustration because I'm sure it doesn't read good when you get a reviewer saying, I can't understand the English. And so you're going to get ticked off. And I, I appreciate it after being in Europe last week where I'm walking around, can't speak the language. It's frustrating and I understand it. But if you're going to submit to these journals, it needs to be quality English writing. Take the time beforehand to make sure it reads well. Very good. And we'll leave it at that. Outstanding work. And gentlemen, my thanks to both of you, Dr. Mike Kogut, editor of the journal Poultry Science, Dr. Brian Fairchild, editor of the Journal of Poultry, Applied Poultry Research. Uh, wonderful resources to all of you as, as authors and reviewers. Encourage you to take advantage of their expertise and their significant uh, experience in publishing in our journals and others in the field. Uh, and I just want to remind you that we hope that we see you in, I think I said, 13 days. 2023 PSA annual meeting is July 10th through the 13th in Philadelphia at the Marriott downtown. Uh, standard registration rates end at 11.59 p.m. Central this Friday. So you've got a couple days yet to take advantage of standard registration rates or you'll pay on-site rates uh, starting on, at midnight, basically July 1. You can find more details and register at poultryscience.org. Just click on the meetings tab for this year's annual meeting. We have a fantastic program, 13 symposia. I think nearly 600 uh, abstracts. Does that sound right, Dr. Fairchild? I think yeah, we were talking about during right. our meeting last week. Uh, hundreds of posters as well in a tremendous exhibit hall with the posters there. A number of social events from our, our uh, barbecue, our welcome reception, lots of opportunities for you to connect and reconnect with 
with other members of uh, the the academy and the broader scientific community. It's going to be a wonderful time. I've ordered uh, great weather for the city of brotherly love. I'm sure that'll come through to us. If you need any help with registration, reach out to Rebecca Reese in our office. She is a delight to work with and has been uh, helping many of you navigate the registration process, but get those registrations in. Uh, we're looking at a significant increase in attendance over last year, which is really heartening. So come be a part of that dialogue. I think it's fair to say this may be our most robust scientific program ever with the uh, significant number of symposia uh, and abstracts. It's a really tremendous program. Hats off to Mike Persia, Casey Owens, the rest of the members of the scientific committee. So join us next week in Philadelphia. Until then, on behalf of the Poultry Science Association, I'm Andy Vance wishing you a profitable rest of your day.